Well, good evening, everybody, and welcome to this evening's Leeds Philosophical and Literary Society talk. Uh, my, my name is Eric Blair. I'm, uh, I'm president of the society, <clears throat> and I'd like to, to welcome you all, uh, members and non-members, and of course, particularly our, uh, our speaker, um, uh, Richard Ovenden, who's, uh, uh, who's based in Oxford. Um, tonight is the uh, annual Priestley Lecture. Um, we, we were, as you were probably aware, we were hoping uh, to run this lecture in the Mill Hill Chapel. Um, which is not, of course, the Mill Hill Chapel that Priestley um, preached in, but uh, it is the successor. Uh, but unfortunately, that proved not to be possible. Um, but the uh, society has a, a kind of in intellectual, uh, an intellectual link with Priestley. Um, and Priestley actually preceded uh, the uh, start of uh, these film lit society. Um, and Priestley died in 1804. And, uh, as you probably know, the, the, the LPLS started in 1819, but um, he, he was a part of the, the intellectual fabric uh, of Leeds, uh, you know, long before that. Uh, and uh, uh, what was part of a, of a group of people uh, who met to discuss um, uh, a whole number of, of issues, but uh, that they were prevented from doing so by the sort of draconian laws that uh, were brought in around the time of the French Revolution. Uh, <clears throat> but um, if I can just say a few words about Priestley, I mean, he was, uh, by any reckoning, a very, a very, a very remarkable man. Uh, he, um, he, he was uh, born in Bristol, uh, just outside of Leeds, uh, in uh, 1733. And uh, <clears throat> he, he, he was as much a theologian and an, an, and an educator as he was a scientist, as a scientist, indeed, uh, his science uh, ranged over chemistry, physics, optics, uh, and a, a whole number of subjects. So it's it's probably to, to, true to say that he was a true uh, natural philosopher, and that that's of course where uh, the philosophy comes from in the title of our society. So he was a very remarkable man, uh, obviously best known of, of oxygen, although he he didn't call it such, he called it deflagistigated air. Uh, and it was um, down to uh, uh, Lavoisier to uh, give it a, a name of oxygen. But um, <clears throat> um, Priestley discovered not just uh, oxygen, but a, a, a number of other gases that, that are present in air. And he was uh, passionately interested in, in air. Uh, and uh, as well on the physiology of, uh, of, of air, as well as the chemistry. So yeah, he was a very wide ranging scientist and, 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 and man. And uh, he, uh, he was in Leeds from 1767 to 1773. Um, after a, a period uh, thereafter, he moved on from Leeds and uh, eventually he, uh, uh, he, he settled in Birmingham for a while. Uh, where uh, th th there was a, a great period of political and re religious ferment uh, stemming from the uh, French and American revolutions, uh, both of which uh, Priestley supported. Um, and uh, he, he became a very kind of dangerous man. And uh, in the, the so-called Priestley riots in, uh, I think, 1791, uh, a mob uh, burned, uh, smashed and burned his laboratory and his, his library. Uh, so uh, his his uh, uh, intellectual inheritance was was burned, uh, and that kind of takes us really to uh, the subject of uh, tonight's talk. Uh, and as I said, it's a great pleasure to um, introduce Richard Obenden, uh, who has uh, studied this aspect of of uh, intellectual life over the ages, and has published an extremely interesting book on the subject. So uh, welcome, Richard. Uh, we're, we're, we're dying to hear what you're going to, to, to say about this tonight. And uh, I, I'm going to hand over to Rachel, who will just kind of introduce you a little bit more formally. Thank you, Eric. Hmm. Yes, well, thank you very much indeed for, for joining us, Richard. And um, I read Burning the Books, uh, this amazing uh, publication of yours at the turn of the year. And 
immediately thought of the connection with Priestley, as Eric has just mentioned. Um, and what, what a story of the um, disasters that have befallen collections of knowledge over the centuries, but the sterling work of librarians and others to, <laughs> to, to rescue um, uh, to rescue collections and reassemble uh, uh, collections. And um, it will be very interesting to hear uh, how your ex exploration of the history of this topic uh, led you to that last uh, uh, very fascinating section on the challenges facing librarians and others involved in information gathering and making it available to people in this day and age. So I'll hand over to you now and uh, if you'd like to share your screen with us and I'll pin your video. Thank you very much. Can't hear anything. Yeah. <clears throat> um, I, I think, Richard, you, you may be muted if you're hearing us. Oh, I'm sorry. I shall start again. <laughs> <laughs> no problem. Um, uh, you, you, you'd have thought I'd have learned how to do this by now. Um, it's uh, so easily. Um, uh, just to say what a what a pleasure it is to be speaking to you this evening and what a great honour to be giving the 2022 Priestley Lecture. And I'm only sorry I'm not able to come up to Leeds and join you in person, but I hope that there'll be another occasion where I may be able to come and be part of your very distinguished society. And um, my task this evening, uh, without hesitation, deviation or repetition, um, and it will last more than a minute, um, is to talk to you about the topic which, um, as Rachel said, um, was of my book that was published actually in the first lockdown in 2020 um, and um, now available in paperback as well as in multiple um, global languages um, should you be tempted, um, which is, uh, as, as Rachel said, it is a, a book about... Um, the destruction of knowledge, the deliberate destruction of knowledge, and particularly the deliberate destruction of libraries and archives. But it's also about the social importance of the preservation of knowledge. And I think it's really more about that and the role that libraries and archives play for society and the lengths that um, citizens, individuals, groups, communities will go to to preserve knowledge and how we can take some inspiration from that and some practical lessons and um, how we should face the realm of knowledge, and particularly public knowledge in a digital age. And I'll come to that um, at, the end of my, at the end of my talk. Um, but I thought I'd just actually begin by talking a little bit about uh, actually events that have happened since I published my book, which unfortunately have only go have only gone to kind of prove the thesis that um, knowledge is continues to be under attack and knowledge continues to be seen as a threat and um, is therefore suppressed by many regimes around the globe. I wrote this essay in the Financial Times weekend just about a year ago in October. October 2021, about the fate of libraries and archives after the Taliban regime had uh, taken over in Afghanistan in, in late August. And um, that unfortunately continues, uh, continues to be uh, a pretty dire situation for, for uh, Afghanistan. Um, we see in the, um, even in the most 
advanced civilizations on the planet today, theoretically, um, the leaders of those civilizations actively participating in attacking knowledge, in this case, uh, President Trump's uh, seizure and attempted um, hiding of uh, classified classified documents, documents that should be considered under the purview of the Presidential Records Act, and which may yet uh, come to um, uh, come to be a much more serious issue that, uh, for Trump than he he thought might be the case. Um, just two 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 and a half months ago. We saw the horrific, brutal attack on Salman Rushdie, um, inspired by, you know, 30 years ago, his publishing, his publishing of, of, of a book, The Satanic Verses. Um, uh, and we have an event uh, a week on Friday in Oxford in support of Salman Rushdie with a number of writers and students reading his works um, in defense of the freedom of expression. And um, in Ukraine right now, knowledge in the form of libraries and archives is very directly under attack. Um, there have been seven entire libraries um, destroyed, over 120 libraries damaged by Russian action. Um, Russian uh, forces, when they seize a territory, have taken library books out, which refer to Ukraine as an independent country, refers to Ukrainian cu uh, culture as being distinct, and they destroy those books, they're burned. Um, and uh, the cyber space is also a field of conflict where uh, the web, the Ukrainian web space is being uh, attacked online by, by Russian forces as well. So this issue has is not a historic issue. It's an absolutely live issue. And that was partly the motivation for writing the book. But the one particular trigger for that was um, my uh, a visit to Berlin in 2018. We have a collaboration between the Bodleian and the State Library of Berlin. Um, I walked along Unter den Linden to their, their, their site in the historic center of Berlin. Um, in 2018 and having been a little early for my meeting I, I wandered around and found the location where the events depicted on your screen took place on the 10th of May 1933 an organized book burning uh, organized by the Nazi party by Joseph Goebbels where students um, had raided neighboring libraries and bookshops synagogues uh, an institute for human sexuality uh, piled the books in a great heap, poured petrol on them and set fire to them whilst being filmed um, and chanted um, about the necessity of destroying books which were considered un-German. And that event um, was repeated around Germany. The film was shown in various locations in subsequent weeks. Um, but it also triggered a response where exactly a year following on the 10th of May 1934 a, a library was opened in Paris um, containing only books deemed by the Nazi party to be un-German and a library a similar library was founded in Brooklyn uh, and indeed the Marx Memorial Library in London um, I, I gathered actually after publishing my book someone wrote to me to say how uh, the, the events of the 10th of May 1933 in Berlin had been one of the props for founding the Marx Memorial Library. But as I was walking around, and there's a very moving plaque in this site, which is incredibly kind of culturally resonant. It's near the State Opera House. It's not far from the site of the former Prussian Royal Palace, what's now known as the Humboldt Forum, across the road from what is now the Humboldt University. And of course, the, the State Library of Berlin was there at the time. That actually my mother was alive when these events took place. She's 93 and she's still going strong. But she, you know, this it struck me that this event didn't take place all that long ago. It was within living memory and that we, we forget these things, I think, as society at, at our, at our peril. And one of the other prompts for the book was being in, in 2017, 2018, when I started to write it, we were 
in the wake of the announcement that there could be such things as alternate facts, a, a comment made by Kellyanne Conway, President Trump's press secretary, in defiance of the evidence that more people had attended President Obama's um, in, inauguration as president than had attended President Trump's. Um, but the real trigger was actually reading a, a, an article by the journalist Amelia Gentleman in the Guardian newspaper um, uh, around the um, the issue concerning the hostile environment, the Home Office's immigration policy instigated from 2010, um, forcing uh, British citizens who had come um, to live and work in the UK at the invitation of, uh, uh, of Britain in the years following the end of World War II, the so-called Windrush era migrants, forcing them to prove through documentation their right to remain in the UK, their right to settle status, and the discovery that the same government department who had instigated the hostile environment, the Home Office, had destroyed an archive of documents that those same citizens could have used to prove their right to remain. And so the irony of this, the kind of rather hollow irony, um, struck me as being uh, a, a classic example of the social importance of the preservation of knowledge. And I wrote an op-ed in the Financial Times um, about this, which then led uh, to, um, uh, to me pu publishing the book two years, two years later. And I also reread George Orwell's uh, famous book, which um, having read it first as a teenager and not read it then for kind of 30 odd years, um, coming back to it, it struck me that this is really a kind of a, a book very much about the control of information. And having been a librarian and an archivist all my life, all my adult life anyway, um, the, the resonances really came through. And I guess my book's central thesis is that libraries and archives are institutions that help society cling to the truth. And my, my study actually goes back to the ancient world, particularly to the, um, the first libraries and archives known to have existed, that we have good documentation around those in the ancient communities of Assyria, uh, in, in Mes Mesopotamia like Assyria. And in 2018, I attended the astonishing exhibition in the British Museum called I Am Ashurbanipal. And in the centre of that exhibition was a library, and a library unlike any other that I'd seen, um, a library of uh, clay tablets. There are around 20,000 of them in the British Museum from the library of King Ashurbanipal, um, who ruled over Assyria from his royal palace in uh, Nineveh, um, outside the modern city of Mosul in the center of Iraq. And the curators of the exhibition made the um, I, I think compelling claim that this is the earliest library that we know of to have attempted to uh, encompass the whole of human knowledge as it was understood at the time. And full of, um, of course, uh, religious texts, but also um, works of medicine, um, works of um, literature like the Epic of Gilgamesh, but also books, a, a great number of books on the prediction of the future, particularly astronomy, astrology, and divination. And I'd like to uh, um, you to kind of focus on that point, because we'll come back to it later in my talk. And I think one of the key aspects that we know, because subsequent to the excavations of Nineveh in the middle of the 19th century, scholars have been deciphering this mass of documentation in the form of the cuneiform tablets and have um, found special reg registers to Ashurbanipal's library. And we know that he was charging his agents to go and seize documents from his enemies um, as um, Assyria um, won various battles against their en neighboring enemies, Babylonia. Um, documents were seized from libraries and archives in Babylonia and taken to enrich the Royal Library in Nineveh. And so this idea that you can use knowledge to weaken your enemies by removing their the documents that would help them predict the future through divination and astrology and make yourself stronger 
as a result is um you know again one of the themes of, of my book this use or misuse of knowledge and and the role that libraries and archives play in that or have done in history um and you know my my uh, colleagues in the Ashmolean Museum in Oxford um also have um uh, a number of extraordinary documents which show us the the richness of but also the antiquity uh, of of preserving knowledge, this kind of very human necessity to preserve um, knowledge, um, and and we see that in you know documents that are four thousand years plus old. Not all of them. Um, uh, you, you know, most th these have all been dug through excavations, but they were in very well uh, organized libraries and archives. Ones which have attributes that librarians like myself and some of you in the in the, on the call would very much recognize today. And here's the great uh, excavator of Nineveh, Austin Henry Layard, um, at work um, in the middle of the nineteenth century in the center of what we now know as Iraq. And of course, the destruction of Nineveh it was the subject of uh, Martin's famous famous uh, uh, painting. This is a mezzotint after the painting. Um, but we, uh, the, the library, we don't think was deliberately destroyed, but rather um, destroyed as a result of the fall of the of, of the city itself. I then in the book look at the most famous or notorious um, dis library destruction in the ancient world, that of the Great Library of Alexandria. And fortunately in the in the Bodleian we, we have um, uh, a, a very ancient document with uh, direct links to uh, at the Library of Alexandria, the oldest surviving copy of Euclid's Elements of Geometry written in the ninth century in the Imperial Academy in Byzantium. Um, and uh, the oldest surviving text of this one of the foundation uh, works of modern mathematics. But Euclid actually wrote the book in the library of, of Alexandria. And really, um, we think of the library of today or ma ma many, you know, many stories of um, being passed down that it was destroyed in a great fire and that the fire uh, ruined um, uh, our knowledge base at, at the time as many works were lost which would have helped society um uh survive the dark ages better that's the the kind of myth of alexandria and if you uh, i i grew up watching um carl sagan's cosmos on on the tv and the first episode of of cosmos had Carl Sagan say, you know, if he could travel anywhere back in time, he'd go back to the ancient library of, of Alexandria before the fire. And he would save all of these scrolls that were lost with the great works of ancient science and philosophy. Um, but actually, if you look at the modern scholarship on the library of Alexandria, um, the scholars today now agree that there was no single moment of destruction of the library. And that all the ancient writers agree on is that uh, the Library of Alexandria was founded as a great um, royal prestige project um, by the Ptolemaic dynasty in um, in Alexandria in the fourth century before the Christian era. It grew to be the greatest library that was known in the ancient world. Uh, but by the fourth century of the Christian era, uh, the library was gone, and that process was not one of a single moment of destruction, although there were many ancient writers who came up with theories of what happened, but one of gradual neglect and decline. And that loss of prestige, that loss of funding, meant that the library um, uh, disappeared essentially uh, over time. And I think that's one of the lessons for our own age is, is the, the lack of attention, the lack of prestige, the lack of uh, funding to um, the organisations which society entrusts with the preservation of knowledge will, will, will lead to its eventual destruction. I then move on in my account to the Middle Ages and particularly to the period of the Reformation in Europe when a vast number of libraries and archives were destroyed deliberately. Um, here I'm standing on the site of the 
Library of the Abbey of Glastonbury in the west of England, um, one of the really great libraries of the Middle uh, Middle Ages in, in England, uh, a famous library in, in one of the wealthiest of the religious houses. Uh, the, the church at Glastonbury was actually bigger than Canterbury Cathedral to give you a sense of its scale and prestige. Um, and we know from various accounts, medieval library catalogues and the visits of a man called John Leland um, in on the eve of the Reformation, that this was uh, a great library, one with uh, probably around 2000 books in its collection, 1500, 2000. Um, and that all that we know of today are 70 books that can be attributed to the medieval collection at Glastonbury. And that destruction is typical of the wholesale um, uh, uh, attacks on knowledge that took place under the reign, reigns of Henry VIII in the first wave of the Reformation and then under Edward VI, where his commissioners um, again visited numbers of uh, a number of library collections. And we're fortunate in Oxford in, in having the archive of this extraordinary man, John Leland, who made um, what he his great friend John Bale recounted as the laborious journey in search of uh, antiquities under the command, under the commission of Henry VIII, to look for texts which would help the king prove an intellectual case for divorcing Catherine of Aragon and marrying the beautiful widow, uh, the beautiful courtier, um, uh, Anne Boleyn. And we actually have in the in our archive the list of books that John Leland um, studied when he visited the library in 1533. And um, we also know from elsewhere, uh, other notes elsewhere in the archive that Leland was desperately looking forward to his visit. The, the library was so well known. And as he crossed the threshold into the library room, he swooned. He literally went weak at the knees at the sight of the ancient books, he said. And he was given a wonderful visit by the aged abbot, John Whiting, shown uh, a number of the books actually on this list, um, which, which Leland then studied over subsequent days. Uh, but I'd like to draw your attention to the uh, entry at the bottom of this list. It says in Leland's Latin, Grammatica Uticis Liber Olim Sancti Dunstani. And that book um, actually survives in the Bodleian today. It's called the Class Book of St Dunstan. It's one of the great books to survive from the Anglo-Saxon period in England. It's actually a miscellany of texts assembled by uh, St Dunstan, the sometime abbot of Glastonbury and then Archbishop of Canterbury. And there on the title leaf or the front leaf, um, arguably the earliest self-portrait in English art with St Dunstan kneeling at the foot of Christ. And this book is again, one of those 69 that survive from the medieval collection at, at uh, Glastonbury and one that survives um, because it was rescued, we don't know the precise circumstances, but from the process of disbursement of the Abbey properties by a West Country antiquary called Thomas Allen, uh, one with Oxford connections, and who then gifted it to the Bodleian um, uh, when it uh, pretty much on its foundation in 1602. And so it's been in the, in the Bodleian for over 400 years. Um, it was in the library of Glastonbury Abbey um, for um, 700 before that. So um, its survival uh, is due to this kind of impulse to, to preserve knowledge in the, in the, in the wake of uh, the destruction. And many of the books um, from those medieval collections ended up being dis dismembered uh, uh, and you know a vast number of them reused as waste matter um, in strengthening book bindings here are a couple in our collections I'm sure um, I, well, I know for a fact that there are similar waste fragments found in in libraries in Leeds um, and there was a saying uh, at the time about libraries in Oxford that uh, books were dog cheap and whole libraries could be had for an inconsiderable nothing. Uh, and that was certainly true for the university library founded in the university church um, in 1320 by Thomas Cobham, the, uh, the Bishop of Worcester. 
um, with a special room dedicated as the library room. It, it's it's still there to this day, but then transferred over to a new building, a much larger, grander library room in the middle of the 15th century, following the gift of books by Thomas, um, uh, by Humphrey, Duke of Gloucester, uh, the brother of Henry V. And it was that library in this room that still survives to this day that the commissioners of Edward VI visited in 1549-1550 and destroyed the collection, um, sending it for waste matter to um, the bookbinders, to glove makers, to pie, pie makers, to lime pie dishes, um, and so on. And it was that uh, pretty much wholesale destruction that affected the next generation uh, very strongly, or some individuals in that generation, including Sir Thomas Bodley here, depicted in a, uh, a miniature painting by Nicola, his childhood friend, Nicholas Hilliard. And uh, he, although he was ardently Protestant, like uh, the commissioners of Edward VI, he nevertheless regretted the destruction very bitterly, and he dedicated the the renewal of the library, the rebuilding, the refounding of the the university library in that room, which he discovered coming back to Oxford in 1598 was laid waste. He said in his autobiography, he dedicated his own life, his own money. Um, he'd married a rich widow, clever man, and um, had no children so he was able to devote that energy his network um, from the court he'd been uh, the ambassador to the low countries um, and his own wealth to re-establishing the library and one with a focus on preservation the early statutes um, the fabric of the building is there dedicated to the preservation um, of knowledge to its security to removing the various threats of fire and flood and so so on uh, I, I'd like to kind of perhaps I should speed up somewhat uh, and move us into uh, an episode in library, the history of libraries that certainly or the history of um, Britain that was not one that I was taught as a schoolboy or indeed uh, at university, but one nevertheless, which is quite, uh, quite shocking to me as a librarian. And that is um, connected with a series of events um, uh, surrounding this man. Uh, Rear Admiral Sir George Coburn, the leader of a British expeditionary force to the uh, recently independent colonies or the new United States of America um, in 1813 and 1814, and in particular the events that are depicted in the background of this marvellous mezzo tint, um, which is the siege and burning of Washington DC in August 1814. And as you can see from this watercolour that survives, um, Coburn's forces besieged Washington, they entered it, and they went straight to the most prestigious building in the city, the only stone building actually, in 1814, the Congress building, housing the two um, houses of the legislature, the offices of the bureaucracy, the administration of government, and indeed the library uh, of Congress. And it was that in coming to that library, um, where they found uh, a goodly amount, as they say, of uh, combustible material. And we know all of this from an extraordinary eyewitness account from a member of the British Expeditionary Force called George Gleig, a Scotsman. Um, and we know from Gleig's account that um, they set fire to the library and that the whole building then went up. And uh, even Gleig um, who thought that the destruction, the burning of Washington, D.C. was a site beyond which nothing, he'd never seen anything more sublime, he wrote, um, that he nevertheless regretted that they destroyed the library. And um, that destruction, you can see the kind of soot from the, the windows um, in, in, this, in this watercolor. Um, there, there was one book that survived and that was taken as booty by one of the British troops um, from the, the room, the office of the president in the Congress building and given to George Coburn as a souvenir, the spoil of the conqueror. And it was then uh, entered, actually, the book trade in the 20th century was presented back to the Library of Congress by the great uh, bookseller, Dr. Rosenbach, in, in 1940. Um, but it's actually the destruction of the library prompted another act of uh, 
preservation, of renewal, and that was um, uh, taken forward by this man, Thomas Jefferson, of course, one of the early presidents of the United States, one of the architects of the American Constitution, and somebody who had retired to his country estate in Monticello in Virginia, not very far from Washington, um, and who had uh, easily the largest and most um, sophisticated private library in the country at the time and he, he, the news of the destruction of the Library of Congress reached him and he wrote an, uh, an outrage letter to a Washington newspaper uh, calling it an act of destruction, uh, invoking the destruction of the Library of Alexandria and saying that it was a, a barbaric act by the British and he offered his own library to replace the, the lost collection not actually as a gift but at, at mate rate as they say and it took um the 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 uh, the two houses of congress uh, about three months to decide whether or not to spend the money and replace the library but eventually they saw sense and spent uh, and bought 7,000 books from, from Jefferson's collection to replace the 5,000 or so that had been destroyed. And um, that library, um, you know, was essentially, although there was another accidental fire in the 1850s, really, you know, the modern Library of, Valley, uh, of Congress really dates from that period um, in 1750, uh, sorry, in 1815 when the the, the library was was essentially refounded on, on on a more on a more modern footing. Uh, exactly a century later, in August 1914, another wave of destruction of libraries began with the start of World War One. And one particular episode I recount in my book, and that's the destruction of the library of the Catholic University of Louvain, or Leuven as it's now known in Belgium. Uh, Belgium, um, uh, a country, of course, which had been independent for less than a century, but whose library in the university was much older than that, going back to the Middle Ages um, with some very handsome uh, buildings, with a, a very important collection, one, one of uh, you know, important manuscripts and uh, uh, early printed collections, but also one that had become a modern university library supported by the legal deposit privilege, which was shared among a number of libraries in Belgium from uh, the 1830s. Uh, but this uh, library suffered um, at the hands of German troops who had invaded neutral Belgium in August 1914, occupied Louvain and set fire to the library in, on August the 25th, 1914, and with pretty much the entire collection destroyed. But interestingly enough, um, this became uh, a, 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 a moment of international outrage. And there are many newspaper reports. This is one from the Irish Times, which again invokes the destruction of the Library of Alexandria, saying what a, again, a calamity without parallel in history. Um, and in fact, this 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 outrage was spread all over the world and um, it became so notorious an act that there's a separate clause in the Treaty of Versailles, um, which charged the German nation on on restocking the library. But it became a, a very uh, and indeed, if you look, if you ever have a dull moment and you look on a thing called Google Books Ngram Viewer, which is really a, a work frequency counting uh, machine. Um, uh, uh, as I did, but just putting the word Louvain into the engram viewer, you can see this great spike in references to Louvain um, uh, at, at, in the second half of the first um, uh, and uh, the second half of the second decade of the 20th century. And in fact, the, the rebuilding, the reconstruction of the Library of Louvain became a very interesting episode in diplomatic history in the exercise of soft power particularly from America, who decided that this would be a great opportunity for them to influence uh, European affairs. And they took it upon themselves to fund the rebuilding of the physical library, whereas the stock of the library, the books, um, was charged to the German nation uh, under the Treaty of Versailles. And here you can see an architect's impression, uh, an American architect called Warren and Wentmore, who were charged who were, um, by a committee 
formed by Nicholas Murray Butler, the president of Columbia University, with raising the money to rebuild the library. And the most important thing, I don't know if you can see it in the bottom of your screen, is a little cartouche which has um, the, the words destroyed by Germans, 1914, restored by America, 1922. So this exercise of soft power um, became a problem in Belgium because it took the Americans rather longer to raise the money to rebuild the library than they'd anticipated. And in the passage of time after the end of World War I, um, there began to be a rapprochement between Belgium and Germany. They decided that it was much better to get on with their neighbors rather than to harbor the grudges of uh, the past and to look to the future. And so um, when the building came to be actually constructed with a big plaque on the wall that said in Latin, destroyed by the Germans, 1914, restored by America, um, uh, the Belgian people were rather unhappy about this and they felt that it was drawing attention to something that they'd rather not have attention drawn to. And in fact, the plaque was smashed in the middle of the night by a, uh, a patriotic Belgian, and it became a major kind of uh, diplomatic inc incident, which resulted eventually in the plaque being removed to an American war grave site outside of Louvain, and America eventually retreating from its uh, attempts to influence European affairs um, in the interwar period. But indeed, the library was rebuilt, uh, only for it to, to be destroyed a second time again at the hands of German troops in 1940 and then rebuilt again a second time um, in the 1950s and the library building looks very much like this today you can still see it if you go to Louvain and uh, uh, thankfully it's still operating as a very busy and excellent university library. Um, of course the Holocaust um, of during World War II or before and du during World War II is arguably the uh, the period of the greatest destruction of knowledge, deliberate destruction of knowledge. It's been argued that over 100 million books were destroyed deliberately during the Holocaust. Now, but I focus on two episodes um, in Central and Eastern Europe um, uh, that took place in almost simultaneously in Vilna or Vilni modern day Vilnius, the capital of Lithuania and in Warsaw. And Vil Vilna was um, uh, a, a great center of Eastern European Judaism. Uh, there was a great Jewish community, a thriving Jewish community on the eve of World War II, uh, but also it was a city of many libraries and archives like the Strashun Library here, uh, donated to uh, the Jewish community in Vilna by a wealthy 19th century uh, Jewish businessman who had great bibliophilic leanings and uh, a city famous for its learned rabbis like the, the Vilna Gaon, um, and a city with, um, with the Strashun, a very a lively city for learning, uh, one with a, a busy reading room in the Strashun Library and a learned librarian in Chaikolunsky. Um, and there was another important institution in the city, an archival institution called Yivo, an institution devoted to um, the collection, uh, uh, preservation and documentation of everyday Jewish life, particularly that life um, depicted in the Yiddish language. And here is um, uh, a, a group at the Yivo Institute learning about psychoanalysis. Um, the Yivo Institute was founded in 1922 uh, by a man called Max Weinrich. And here are some of the kinds of things that the Yivo Institute collected, um, uh, you know, very much kind of ephemeral or everyday uh, material that documented the life of everyday, uh, uh, the, the everyday life of the Jewish community. So, you know, theatre, music hall songs, theatre posters, um, medical case notes. Here's the, on the left hand side, the uh, diaries of Theodore Herzl, one of the founders of Zionism. But as um, World War II unleashed Operation Barbarossa on Central and Eastern Europe. The Nazi Blitzkrieg had a cultural element to it as well as a military element. And that cultural element took the form of an operational group 
founded by the man on the left of your screen, Alfred Rosenberg, one of the chief architects of anti-Semitism, and who had uh, in, in Germany in the 1930s, and who had founded an institute in Frankfurt called the Institute for the Study of the Jewish Question. And that institute had a library where they attempted to amass books, many of them in Hebrew or Yiddish or about the, the Jewish faith and the Jewish uh, culture and civilization. That operational group, the Einsatzstab Reichsleiter Rosenberg, was led by the man on the right-hand side of your screen, a librarian called Johannes Puhl, whose job it was to um, use his troops in the field to identify books and documents to be sent back to Rosenberg's perverted research institute in Frankfurt. And as the German troops occupied um, uh, Lithuania in, uh, in 1942, they established the ghetto, they forced the Jews into the ghetto, and then they uh, identified librarians, archivists, scholars, who they then forced at gunpoint out of the ghetto uh, each day to sort through the collections of the libraries and archives in the city. Some of the books to be identified as unique or important were sent back to Frankfurt, the rest sent to paper mills outside of the city for pulping. And you can imagine how horrible a task, how terrible a task that would have been for the librarians and archivists. And they were called the paper brigade um, by the German guards, and they soon took that name for themselves. But actually what they did is they saw, took every opportunity to hide documents in their clothes, to smuggle them back into the ghetto each evening, and to hide them uh, in the ghetto, building underground chambers where they hoped that the documents would survive them and would be recovered as uh, documentation of their life, uh, their lives before the, the, the war, before the Holocaust. And uh, many of them, of course, as they did this, were risking their lives each time if they had been caught smuggling documents back into the ghetto, they would undoubtedly have been killed. And eventually, of course, the occupants of the ghetto were murdered by the Nazis um, in 19, late 1943. Uh, but a few of the members of the, the paper brigades uh, escaped and joined partisans in the forest. Um, who, with the Soviet troops, retook the city in 1944, and they were able to re-establish, um, find the the hidden troves of documents in the in the rubble of the ghetto, and re-establish the Yivo Institute and other collections in the city. And a similar uh, period took uh, similar events took place in Warsaw, unbeknownst to. Uh, the members of the Vilna Ghetto, led by a man called Emanuel Ringoblun, who had a group called Oineg Shabes, who sought documentation of the life of the Warsaw Ghetto itself. Um, and they hid, again, similarly, they hid their documents as best they could in the uh, in underground chambers, uh, hoping that someone would survive and that they would be recovered and that their lives would be borne witness to by this archive. And here you can see a kind of reenactment of the discovery of the Oineg Chabez archive. Uh, and here are the, uh, the, the, the containers which the documents were, 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 were preserved in. But actually, astonishingly, um, American troops overrun Rosenberg's Research Institute in Frankfurt. They found a massive library and archival collection, hundreds of thousands of books and documents, and a great process um, took place to reunite those collections with their lawful heirs. And here you can see um, documents from the Vilna libraries from the Yivo Institute being sent to New York to a small branch of the Yivo Institute which had been founded um, before um, excuse me before the before the war uh, arrived in in Vilna and so um, this process an extraordinary process of moving great collections around Europe much much of it to uh, the United States 
uh, again m many collections moved to israel uh, or um uh, and I, I talk at great length about the the challenges that faced the surviving Jewish communities at the time of finding the, the rightful heirs. But there's a kind of coda, an extraordinary coda to the story in Vilna, which is that um, the documents that were rescued from the rubble um, of the Vilna ghetto um, were used to re-establish libraries and archives like the Yivo Institute in the city, only a few years later for them to fall foul of communist ide ideology where the collections were sent once again to the paper mills for destruction and uh, this time they were rescued by a Lithuanian librarian a man called Antonas Ulpis who s drove trucks back from the paper mills full of documents and hid them in an outpost of the National Library which was in a disused church, even hiding documents in the organ pipes of the church, and kept them a secret, only revealing it to a few of his trusted colleagues in the National Library. Um, and this secret was kept until 1989, when it was safe once again to reveal these collections, which had survived the Nazis, uh, the communist censorship and destruction. Um, and they are being digitized today by the National Library of Lithuania and the Evo Institute in New York. Uh, unfortunately, August is not a good month for libraries. So not only in 1814 and 1914 were great libraries destroyed, but in August 1992, um, in the wars of the um, breakup of the former Yugoslavia, the National Library of Bosnia and Herzegovina in the city of Sarajevo was targeted by Serbian militia who were besieging the city uh, and on that day they targeted the National Library with incendiary shells. No other buildings were, were attacked that day. It was deliberate uh, attempt to destroy the knowledge of an entire country um, um, and one which had attempted to um, provide some kind of cultural uh, a, a, a rapprochement between the Muslim, Jewish and Christian communities. Um, and so those collections in the National Library reflected the multicultural background of the city and the country. Uh, but that is what the Serb militia wanted to destroy and to eradicate. And not only did they fire incendiary shells into the National Library, but as librarians and firefighters formed um, chains to try and rescue collections, they were targeted by sniper fire. And one of the librarians, Ada Butarovic, was murdered on that day by Serb sniper fire. And that heralded um, uh, wholesale destruction across Bosnia and Kosovo at the hands of the Serbs, where, um, for example, entire land registries were destroyed uh, in order to uh, erase any records of Muslims owning property um, in Bosnia. And there's one individual, a librarian at Harvard called Andras Riedelmeier, who um, uh, uh, it came to him that many of the manuscript holdings of the libraries in Bosnia that were destroyed at the hands of the Serbs had exchanged microfilm copies of their collections with other libraries ar around the world. And he, he started a process of tracking down those copied microfilms, um, both in institutional libraries, but also in the libraries of scholars, and he amassed them um, in the, the library, uh, the Fine Arts Library in Harvard, where he worked and digitized them and handed them back to uh, the libraries in, in Bosnia to help them reconstruct their, their lost collections. And Andras was actually charged by UNESCO in doing a, a detailed inventory of the losses of libraries and archives in Bosnia and Kosovo, and ended up actually giving evidence at the trials in the International War Crimes Tribunal for the former Yugoslavia at The Hague, uh, in the International Courts of Justice, um, staring just a few feet away from the murderers Slobodan Milosevic and Raklan Madic, looking them in the eye and giving his testimony of uh, the dest destruction of those libraries. I'd like to end um, by talking a little bit about our current uh, position in the world with the the rise of um, you know, ubiquitous digital knowledge. And in 
uh, particularly the moment that we live in when there's so much interest in access to information um, and calls for all sorts of organizations and uh, national um, company and uh, institutional collections to be opened up um, where so much of knowledge is now housed on platforms that are controlled by major technology corporations, what my colleague in Oxford, Timothy Gartnash, calls the private superpowers. And you can see with this example of what happened uh, with Flickr at the end of 2018, where they changed their business model and whole realms of uh, you know, vast amounts of documents, image files, uh, other, other kinds of digital information were uh, destroyed at a, at a stroke because it didn't fit the new business models and you see that also with the web um my library like many others is involved in, in web archiving you can see from the the work that we've done with the uk web archive as part of our legal deposit responsibilities just how fragile the web is as a medium for preservation it's really not very good at all and um you can see that with the case of the website of the Supreme Court in the United States, um, which in 2011, the Harvard Law Library did a survey and discovered that no fewer than 40% of the web links led nowhere, um, suffering from what we in the profession call link rot. Uh, and how important is it for society that the laws of the land are available to its citizens? Well, how can this be when the website of the Supreme Court won't even give um, links to the decisions of, of, of the highest legal entity in the country. And we see that e even more today with the rise of the Internet of Things with wearable devices. I don't know how many of you wear Fitbits or Apple Watches that are recording your biometric data. Well, that data is owned by the tech companies. It's being sent to them in real time. Uh, and Google just bought Fitbit. Um, about a year ago, so they can now match up your biometric data with your search engine history. So, you know, if you're um, feeling a little bit under the weather, they can look to see whether you're searching for the symptoms of heart disease. Now, that might be useful in aggregation and anonymized data for um, epidemiology or public health reasons, but Google might find it useful to sell that information to your health insurer for example so this is becoming of grave concern i think to society because of the dominance of the the um the big tech companies the private superpowers and the control of that knowledge it seems to me needs to be wrested back from those corporations it's getting even worse when you see um companies springing up who um uh say that they they are willing to track individuals movements because your iphone and other wearable devices leave a geo referenceable trace um left behind now um there have been various allegations that this company for example um ha have been ha ha are engaging in those kinds of um commercial activities and we saw it with um, the insurgents who occupied the Capitol building um, uh, at the fall of Donald Trump. Uh, they were using a, an encrypted messaging service called Parler. Parler was quickly taken off the, um, the uh, app stores, um, uh, but uh, uh, a not-for-profit organization called the Internet Archive captured the parlor website um so keeping uh, vital information um before it was it was deleted by the big tech companies and we've seen also with the revelations about um facebook's work with cambridge analytica in targeting political advertising to influence the 2016 presidential elections that um there is an increasing use of data profiling uh, data that we all create for free on these platforms being used not just for commercial advertising, but for more political reasons. And so um, this is of um, 
uh, again, of, of grave concern because we do not have a Facebook archive. We do not know what the political adverts were that were targeted at, at voters uh, in, in, in 2016 and in other elections. But some libraries are trying to uh, seize control. Uh, the National Library of New Zealand has a very interesting project at the moment where they're asking New Zealanders to donate their Facebook profile so that they can, uh, you know, gain a, a record of what is happening um, uh, as played out on Facebook. Um, and um, I mentioned the cyber warfare in Ukraine, where we have a project at the moment um, archiving Ukrainian websites uh, and indeed Russian websites, actually, um, but also looking at social media accounts, trying to archive um, uh, social media accounts in re real time so that we have a record of what is going on um, being played out in, in social media at, at, at the moment. And in our political domain, again, I, I wrote an op-ed in the FT back in 2020 about the use of encrypted messaging services like WhatsApp by uh, British cabinet ministers and senior civil servants and special advisors. And uh, I drew attention to the fact that I felt that the ministerial code was not being adhered to because uh, those messages were not being preserved. Uh, and I felt that they fell uh, squarely under the 20 uh, under the 1958 Public Records Act, um, and then um, uh, a few years later, of course, we have um, uh, the Partygate affair, and suddenly a great deal of uh, interest um, in the um, the um, the commissions of inquiry into the WhatsApp messages used by politicians like Matt Hancock and and Boris Johnson. And we saw with Donald Trump where his use of social media was an absolutely central aspect to his uh, political campaigning. He was an absolute master user of the medium of Twitter uh, and it left the National Archives um, with a dilemma because um, uh, they actually had to use, they didn't have access while he was president to uh, the presidential Twitter feed. But fortunately, an independent activist group called FactBase set up an automatic screenshot program where they were able to capture every single tweet that Donald Trump made, but also the ones that he deleted. And by the end of his presidency, there are over 1400 deleted tweets, uh, and these have all been passed over um, to the National Archives to form uh, the basis of the, the, the Trump presidential library which leads us uh, to close on uh, George Orwell's famous 1984 again. And I think this really kind of sums up the position that we're in with things like the use of encrypted technologies um, and the use of digital information today. And it really falls to libraries and archives to do as much as they can to preserve these these ephemeral digital worlds and i argue in my book for a memory tax on the profits of the big tech companies to fund the work of libraries and archives in this vital digital preservation role uh, and i'd just like to end my, my book ends with a coda of five reasons why we should um value libraries and archives and obviously the most obvious one is about education and um, uh, the ability for individuals from whatever their background, whatever their financial means to educate themselves. Um, then there's the idea that libraries bring a diversity of knowledge um, to their communities, um, not only a diversity of language, but a diversity of ideas um, to challenge, perhaps to challenge ideas that you hold yourself, but in a library you can have access to ideas that are contrary to your own to test them because as John Stuart Mill says in um, On Liberty, only by challenging our ideas with a diversity of, uh, of, of knowledge can um, the truth have any, uh, have uh, the half, half a chance of uh, being objective. 
Um, libraries and archives are the places where the rights of citizens are enshrined. You saw that. This is actually a photograph of the Stasi archive in Berlin, where citizens at the in 1989 marched into Stasi uh, buildings all over the country to ensure that their own files were not destroyed. Um, libraries and archives, I argue, are reference points for truth and facts, um, where both um, uh, knowledge can be verified, uh, scientific data can be reused, um, and, and facts can, can be tested. And finally, libraries and archives are places where the identity of individuals, of communities, of society can be preserved, um, you know, take either in local history collections or in this case the collection of uh, documents from Ethiopia that we were able to share with um, people in Britain from Ethiopia with Ethiopian heritage. I've slightly run over my hour I realize but I, I, I wonder I'm, I'm happy to stay and answer any questions. Richard um... Thank you so much for a uh, for a terrific talk. Um, get, maybe can we unshare the screen? Sure. Uh, the virtual round of applause, everybody, for uh, yeah, for, for a terrific talk from uh, for, from Richard. Wonderful. Thank you. You, know, you. You only covered about six thousand years <laughs> <laughs> in 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 an hour. <laughs> no, no, it was a fantastic uh, feat of uh, erudition and. Uh, 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 such a detailed and, and uh, you know, deep understanding of uh, all, all the issues involved. So thank you very much for that. I'm, I'm sure that's kind of stimulated lots of questions um, in, uh, in our minds. Um, uh, you can write your questions in the chat and uh, uh, Rachel and I will read them out to Richard or uh, you can unmute yourself and, uh, and ask questions. So up to you folks. Um, get, so get, get, get. I thought, so thank, we've had several thank yous in, in the chat. Yes, we, we have. And people are saying that it's a, that words like fascinating, excellent. Um, that, that, thank you very much. So uh, uh, highly appreciated by the audience, uh, Richard. Thank you again. Um, I mean, could, could, could I possibly start uh, by, by asking, I mean, you know, clearly, you know, uh, knowledge culture and, uh, you know, repositories. Uh, there's a common theme here, isn't there, of, um, of, 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 be, of it being targeted for destruct, to destruction to re remove uh, collective memories and, and, and things like that, you know, from Assyria, you know, to Ukraine. But, uh, I mean, are we now seeing, I mean, we often uh, get these uh, uh, pieces of news saying that, uh, you know, Ukraine has uh, come under cyber attacks and so on and we, we were never really told what you know what what are these cyber attacks targeting um i mean is there any evidence that they're targeting um you know archives and you know um the digital digital I, libraries? I, uh, I i i i've not heard that they've been particularly targeted i think what the targeting is doing is taking down broad swathes of infrastructure yeah. so um you know, uh, server farms, networked in infrastructure. Um, they're targeting um, software that controls traffic lights. Yes, yes. Those kinds of bits of civic infrastructure. Um, what there is a group called SUCHO, which I forget what the acronym stands for, but something like Saving Ukraine's Cultural Heritage Online. I think that is yeah, what SUCHO yeah, stands yeah. for. Um, who is a group of libraries and archives around the world who are trying to do backups, um, organize backups from the websites uh, of digitized collections of museums and libraries and archives in Ukraine. So uh, that's that's going on. Um, yeah. But I think it's um, I think it's kind of the deliberate targeting of a kind of current digital infrastructure that is where the cyber cyber warfare is going and where, um, if you like, more of the cultural heritage side has been lost, has been through the kind of wholesale 
taking out of 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 infrastructure and yeah, actually you see again you know i was talking about the private superpowers well you see that much of the internet that um enables uh ukraine to keep working is actually controlled by elon musk with his starlink mm-hmm. service mm-hmm. so you know there's one individual who has the power to control the communications of and practically of an entire country and that seems to me to be a very dangerous thing for the world yeah. to have been yeah. uh, placing such power in the hands of such an individual yes indeed so uh, following on from that, Richard, um, you mentioned the notion of a of a memory tax on these huge digital operators. Um, and how how do you envisage that, uh, apart from the uh, problems of persuading them that they should be thus taxed uh, and paying it across? How would you ideally use the proceeds? How would you use um, to, to fund people to do more of this sort of what has hitherto had to be done by sort of activists? Yes, I, I mean, I think, you know, the basic, you know, my message is that the, you know, institutional libraries and archives, um, public libraries and archives, national libraries, university libraries should be better resourced because there's no one institution that can bear the burden of uh, both preserving the paper record of the past or the paper and parchment and papyrus of the past and the digital of the future. You know, this is something where uh, libraries have been used to working in collaboration with one another. That we've been used to the redundancy of shared print collections, which has served the world well, I would argue, uh, where multiple institutions hold multiple copies of the same title, and that provides um, that provides a degree of redundancy, which is valuable. And we see, you know, there is a um, a project in uh, called Locks lots of copies keep stuff safe which is an attempt to do the same in the digital world which is basically um using redundant processing power in library computing rooms to store um uh, back backed up copies of electronic journals mm-hmm. so these these kind of approaches are, are are there libraries and archives do the best that they can do um, as a legal deposit library, we work with the British Library, Cambridge University Library, Trinity Dublin, and the two national libraries in Scotland and Wales to archive the whole UK web domain. And we co-fund that activity. The team is based in the British Library, but we distribute the curatorial responsibilities. And we've been doing that since 2004, when the UK Web Archive was founded. And under uh, and since 2013, we've had the legal power to do it um, when the legal deposit regulations were changed. So, you know, we have we are building our capacity, we're building our skills. Uh, what we really lack is the money to do it yeah. at the scale which I think we need to do it in today's world where the big tech companies are able to innovate and change their workflows, change their technology platforms change their business models very very rapidly and you know we're slow we're we're painfully slow by comparison and so we can only compete if we have more resources and i, I you know i don't see that coming from general taxation there's enough pressure on that um at, at the moment so, but i think actually a, a a good source of that particularly when these companies are making obscene profits and they pay so little tax in in uh, certainly in this country that why not tax them properly tax just a tiny sliver of their profits and pass it back to libraries and archives make a massive difference i've uh, wished that um, these global companies you know, they always manage to say well how can you possibly work out in which jurisdiction the taxes should be paid Surely, uh, uh, for organisations like this, a tax such as the memory tax, uh, channel it through the through UNESCO. Well, um, it's got to be collected by um, the relevant jurisdiction, so it, it has to be collected by um, uh, by the by the government. Mm-hmm. Um, how they, I, you know, I can't believe that they can't work out a way of doing it um it's it's the political will that's lacking mm, mm, yeah. quite 
I wonder if you'd comment on university libraries destroying their own collections, the, the sort of move to the all sofas and no books kind of library, which is also apparent in some public libraries too. Yeah. Um, but also I, I mean, libraries that will just throw out anything that they regard as old. So in selecting what to keep and what to throw away, they keep the new stuff that looks good, um, but anything that's kind of dog-eared or yellowing, they do get rid of. So books that were written in, say, the 1950s are absolutely a target. And those aren't the ones that are on Google Books. <laughs> so they're the ones that perhaps you should throw away last rather than first, but they are the ones that go, go first. Well, um, I you know, all I, all I can say, having worked in libraries for 40 years, is um, that libraries have always deaccession collections. So, um, they should, they normally do it in a fairly, or they should do it in an orderly process of um, consultation with users, and then with consultation with local libraries, so that when uh, the libraries that I've worked in who have done deaccessioning don't get rid of unique material or material that's not held um, elsewhere by local libraries there or if they do deaccession and they're offered to other collections so that they're kept in local communities um, and that records of those uh, uh, deaccessioned items are kept so that um, we know what was held in those collections um, and so li li libraries have you know, should follow good, well accepted practice, practice which is um, document procedures and policies which are documented by the professional organisation SILIP. I was responsible for um, helping compile some for uh, rare book deaccessioning um, for the Chartered Institute of Library and Information Professionals. Um, so, um, you know, I, I think libraries have always, you know, refreshed and renewed their collections in that way. Sometimes they get it wrong, they don't do it in the right way. But most of the time, certainly the experience that I've had, that it's done in a very kind of orderly and measured way, uh, and in a way that doesn't remove unique material um, from a community where it's shared with other, that responsibility is shared with other collections. Can I, uh, Richard, Matt Harry has um, done quite a long comment and question in the chat. Uh, I think he's very approving of your talk and of your, your account of the uh, restoring of the library at Louvain. Uh, but his question really is, what checks and balances would you suggest to ensure that the restoration of knowledge is carried out with a maximum of transparency and Ooh, a little potential uh, problematic political yeah I, that, that's a very that's a very good question it kind of relates to the previous one in, in a way because there's kind of an ethical component to this the, the ethical practice of librarianship both in its um the way that collections are maintained um the transparency in which decisions are taken and documented so that it's clear to everyone what has gone on and that uh, communities have been consulted and in terms of uh, conservation or, or preservation um, certainly uh, the uh, the profession the preservation and conservation profession are now very very um, uh, concerned to document their procedures fully um, and to do so in a way that's reversible so not to undertake actions which cannot be reversed uh, and we see so many brutal examples of attempts to restore documents in previous generations which have ended up making them worse um, so those kind of reversible uh, techniques are very very important and then uh, to make make any restorations visible transparent that you can actually see what is old paper and what is new paper if a yeah. sheet of paper has been restored mm -hmm. that that process is clear all the way through from documentation to um the actual inaction of the the preservation method can i just ask a question i mean is a librarian now a tax specialist not not 
you know, we, we've 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 got the image of a librarian, haven't we? We we, we know librarians, but uh, is the modern librarian um, a tech specialist? Yeah, absolutely. They have to be. They have to be. They have to be all of those things. Or, yeah. Um. Or within an organisation, there has to be subject skills. Um. There have to be domain skills. Um. If you have important manuscripts in your collection you need manuscript specialists as well as technology specialists and often manuscript specialists are technically very competent I certainly have people in in of my colleagues in the bodily and who fall into that category yeah. so um yeah the the, the tech uh, the tech specialism has to be there and I think one of the things which I think increasingly is certainly for people at the um at the senior levels in our organizations they have to be better at communicating they have to be better at influencing public policy they have to be better about um explaining the pressures that their institutions face in the modern world arguing to the funding bodies um with increasing intensity and passion and to the people who've whose votes influence those funding bodies or those governing bodies um we can't you know we can't allow mm. our institutions just to drift we have to be much more active in the yes. in the public sphere in a kind of habermasian sense well on that well, well positive now i think <laughs> um <laughs> Uh, I think we've, we, we've, I mean, we've kept you, we've kept, we've kept you going for quite a long time here, Richard. I think we'll probably draw the formal, uh, formal uh, proceedings uh, to, to a close. Um, thank you again. I mean, uh, I, I'd say, you, you know, not, not, not only did, did you give us a wonderful talk, you also give, gave us a wonderful round of questions, actually. Uh, and that, thank you for, uh, for, for, for your detailed insight into all of this, and it's certainly given me a lot to, uh, a, a lot to think about. Well, um, thank you for the great questions and thank you once again for the invitation. I felt very honoured to be asked. Great. And uh, we, we, we're also looking forward to, um, you know, getting you back sometime and uh, uh, meeting you in okay. person. Wonderful. Thank now, you very much. You, you're very welcome. And uh, yeah, somebody, somebody, Elizabeth has says, do read his book, everybody. I couldn't I couldn't agree more. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yes, thank I you. thoroughly recommend. Thank you.